everyone. Welcome to TechCrunch Live, where we help founders build better venture-backed businesses. We do this by talking to founders and the investors that finance them and how they came together, what decisions they made, and how they work together. I'm your host, Matt Ferns, but you don't care about me. You're here for the guests, and I'm very excited about this episode. I did a long prep call with units Itai Damti and Emlyn Shaw from Flourish Ventures, and this is going to be a great episode. And if if anything, make sure you stick around until we at least speak to units values document. It's impressive and a really neat thing to, to include in a pitch. Now, this show is streaming on a lot of different services, but we hope you can join us and hop in where you can leave comments and network with other guests and talk to TechCrunch staff. And this brings up the first of two quick announcements. We're doing a pitch feedback session at the end of this, this interview, and we still need three startups. You can find the instructions on how to apply and hop in. Second, next week, we have a very special SaaS edition of TCL with Index Ventures and DeepScribe. And tomorrow on Found Live, Daryl and Jordan has, has a great guest, and all this can be found in the reception area in Hopin. So that's enough business. Let's, uh, let's continue and look at this pitch deck. I'm really excited to introduce Emily Shaw, managing partner of Flourish Ventures, where she co-manages $500 million global venture fund, where they focus on investing in disruptive financial services. Em, how are you doing? Great. Thanks so much for having us. This is your second time here. So, so thanks for coming back. Yes. Hey, must've been good. It was great. No, I really appreciate great. it. And then we have Itai Damti from Unit. He's joining us from Israel right now where it's the late at night and they do a developer platform that allows third parties to integrate banking services into their businesses. Unit was founded in 2019 and has raised 69 million over four rounds. And things are looking pretty good for Unit. So Itai, let's start with you. How are you? Great. Thanks for having us, Matt. Yeah. So this pitch deck, this is from when you were just starting. It was Series A, right? It was. I mean, we raised our seed, but we used the same same deck with some update slides. And this was from 2020? So seed was in late 2019, and okay. uh, Series A was in August 2020. Well, let's talk about this then, starting with the Series A. So if you can take us back to that, that time, it was mm -hmm. 2020 middle of summer and you're, you're raising rounds. Can you talk to us what your expectations were raising money then, what you were looking for in investors and, and how many investors you talked to before this thing finally came together? Mm -hmm. So um, in late 2019, we raised our uh, seed round. It was a 3.6 million seed. And for seven months, it was just the two of us in the company. It's not something that investors love hearing, but we saw our execution, our best execution is just de-risking some key items around banking and the product itself. And that was the first seven months of the company. So I would say until June um, 20, uh, 2019, it was just the two, or 2020, it was just the two of us. And then in, around that time, we started hiring people on the compliance side and really signing the bank partnerships that allowed us to go to market. That was the point that we could step up things and, and think more broadly about the market. Uh, our investors felt that there was a momentum in the market that allowed us to you know, make a splash and, and um, leave our mark in the category. And then we talked to a variety of investors it was our biggest number of investors that we spoke to in a single round. Seed was pretty lean. Mm. Series B was pretty lean. A was where we spoke to, I think, 24 investors. And we ended up getting four term sheets and taking um, two of them that together formed the 50 million round. How, how long did it take to talk to 24 investors? It takes a good month and a half of your life. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, we, we like parallelizing things. And, you know, we didn't speak to investors before that time because we thought that there was a time to build a company. When it comes to time to speak to investors, we do it all in. And so in the course of two weeks, I spoke to 14, 15. We expanded it to a couple more conversations in the week after. And then those processes moved in parallel pretty much. It was still a painless fundraising process, relatively speaking. But it, again, it takes a good month, month and a half to close okay, so, the whole thing. So this is like a dating show. Tell me who... Who met first? How did you guys meet? <laughs> em, do you want to start? Sure. Look, I mean, we we loved, we were looking very heavily at kind of enabling technologies that embedded financial services. Uh, and having been investors early in like Chime and Aspiration and about seven other challenger banks, we understood how hard it was to build banking as a service uh, products. It took two mm. years, $2 million. And so we wanted a technology company that was solving that problem in a matter of weeks for companies to make it really seamless. So we were looking at everyone in the space and we were dating and meeting with entrepreneurs. And our dear friend, we met Itai and Duran through our dear friend, Sheila Manat at uh, Better Tomorrow Ventures. They did led the seed. And we had been really just checking in with them ever since. 
every month we just check in to see how he was doing and to his credit and Duran, they were heads down. They weren't looking mm-hmm. for, they didn't want to have venture conversations. They would, they would entertain conversations and check-ins, but they had very clear deliverables they wanted. And when they were ready to, you know, put the foot on the gas, that's when we kind of re-engaged. I, I want to get into this pitch deck, but one more question before we get into that. I, Itai, tell me what it's like to have the investors pursue you. You know, it's it's a. I think the best thing you can do to make it happen is to just execute. It's it's a. There's a funny dynamic where people, you know, think they should be playing with investors. I think the game of running a company is really running the company mm-hmm. and not thinking about investors. And then the byproduct of obsessing with running the company day to day and de-risking it step by step is investors talking to you. Um, so I think we get approached by many investors. We typically say no to intros, even if they're exploratory, even in quote unquote relationship building. Uh, we are precise in how we execute and we like to spend time on the real important stuff, which is building the company. So I don't want to speak to, you know, the kind of pleasant feeling of getting approached by investors. Let's talk about the unpleasant feeling of, you know, coming today, every coming to work every day and like building the company build by brick by brick and and dealing with problems and risks. Um, and by the way, we love it. It's just that that's the real work of being an entrepreneur. And I think investors are in fundraising are a byproduct of that. Absolutely. And I think you have a long history in entrepreneurship and, and it seems like you've done this before, right? Yes. So we've uh, done this once with no VC funding. It was a very different journey. Yes. All right. Well, let's get into this pitch deck. All right. If we can load this thing up. Um, can you tell me what you thought when you first saw this, this, this pitch deck? What were your first takeaways? Well, again, we had built this relationship with the company and we were really, we were incredibly um, taken by the team and the way they were approaching the problem. So for us, many of these slides, as we'll discuss, we were we had, we knew we weren't educated in terms of what the problem space was, what they were trying to do. Mm-hmm. What we were really focused on is who's behind it. Why are they the best suited to solve this problem, and what are they bringing to the equation? And I think the slides that we'll talk about highlight some of those pieces, which we can dive into. All right. Well, let's let's just dive right in this. So you have slide number one here. With the uh, the title slide, why don't you take it away and tell us your story? We'll give you a few. Sure, minutes that. uh, that's that's an ugly logo I designed uh, when we were just two gigs in the garage at Fiverr for thirty five bucks. Uh, it was the second iteration, and it was good enough, so we just took it. Uh, we, yeah. we actually thought about fintech as a feature as our tagline. Um, some people thought it was sort of playing down our role in the tech ecosystem, and the way we like to think about it is Unit is a low ego brand, and we like to power products but we also like to take a backseat and, and do it in a quiet way. Uh, and so FinTech as a feature felt concise. I don't know if it was the right tagline, but it was something that felt right for the time and something that's thought provoking and sounds intriguing enough to attract people who are looking at the deck. So that's the, that's the opening slide. You can go to the next one. So I, I think our, we tried to think about the flow that best tells the story of the company and we, we landed on a, on a composition of about 25 slides. Uh, This is, of course, setting the stage with one statement about what we do as a company. So what we do is help tech companies build financial uh, feature, financial financial products into their own products. And launch vertical banks is something that I think we could have removed. But the way we capture the, the, the mission is we want to collapse the barriers for companies to offer valuable financial products to their end customers and increase financial inclusion. And that was the, you know, the concise matter of fact statement plus bigger mission and how we look at sort of the next 10 years or so. So that's the the first statement. The next one was really a statement um, about the team. One of the things that bothered us starting this company is that even though we had credentials and we had experience running our previous company, that was a fintech infrastructure company that we co-founded in Israel, the company was not well known in Silicon Valley. And so when you approach investors with something that they see every day and there's an element that, that makes a big part of the story, we wanted to lead with that element. And I think one more thing that was important for us to state was that our previous company took no VC funding. And it was a source of pride because bootstrapping a 160 people company from four clueless founders is a, at the age of 22 is, is a journey that takes uh, time and tenacity. And that was the um, sort of summary of what we did at our, at our previous company. We went back to the team towards the end, but that was you know the big statement about our ability to de- deliver at scale, ability to grow a company, and to do it in a, in a sufficiently complex space. We like talking about banking, what we do now, being even easier than trading, which mm-hmm. is a 24-5, 24-7 often world. And so that was the statement that we have 
done something that um, de-risks us, at least partially as founders. Well, let's pause here and talk about this. This uh, disrupts mm -hmm. the, the general flow of a pitch deck, right? You're supposed mm -hmm. to present the problem and then the solution and then competitors. And then at the very end, they tell you you're supposed to tell them about yourself, but you're putting it first. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, have, have you received any feedback on this? Um, I think we received uh, good, like the reception has been good because it was good because I think one of the things people think about when they think about fintech, especially infrastructure, is does the team have the chops to execute and grow this business? Getting 90% right in fintech is not enough. Getting 95% in, in fintech is not enough. Getting 99.999 is the goal. And that's what we are trying to communicate to that slide. So I think it did, I mean, people can't ignore when two people say we co-founded a company, we spent a decade at that company. There's a substantial chapter in our history. We've worked before, which is another way to say mm -hmm. we are de-risked as a couple. Um, and so, you know, we've known each other for 18 years. We've been building for 15 out of those 18 years now. Uh, making that statement in the beginning was really important for us. Yeah, em Emeline, can you speak to this slide? How often do you see a team slide so early in the deck? Of this type, with these types of accolades, I think very rarely. And certainly for us, again, as I said before, really understanding who you're backing. And it's not just that they're incredibly seasoned. That obviously goes without saying. They understand what it means to scale a very difficult business. But they've actually worked together, and they're very committed to culture. And particularly in a uh, you know a company like this, where they are dual headquartered uh, in New York and in Israel, that importance, that ability to really work together so closely is just that much more important. And to me, it's it's those facets together that really resonated for us. And it certainly panned out as we did our diligence, just was incredibly validated through every conversation we had. And I would still mm -hmm. say that uh, the reception of this slide was probably not as good as saying something like, I worked for Stripe for six years as an engineer. You know, even though we had this founding experience, even though we scaled the company globally, the today processes 200 billion a month on homegrown infrastructure, it, it wasn't a strong enough statement for many investors who seek well-known credentials or well-known companies. And I think even, even then it's, it's, it's difficult. So the brand of our previous company didn't go far enough, but hopefully our cohesion as a team and our passion for what we're building was, was uh, at least intriguing. Very good, let's keep going. Great, so I think one thing that investors are looking to get from every seed deck or pitch deck is you need to teach them something. So the insight we chose to lead with is, is the, setting the trend before even stating the problem, setting the trend that we see in the market that we think is going to last 10, 20 years and, and beyond. And the trend we saw is that many companies in FinTech and you know old FinTech 2008 onwards are companies that chose to focus on one product. And what defined that wave of FinTech companies is that they try to do one product and do it better, faster, cheaper than the incumbents, the banks. And some companies succeeded. The companies we see here succeeded or reached scale. Hundreds of companies failed to get the distribution and the economies of scale of the banks and, and basically folded. And so that was the first wave that I think everybody knows and packaging it as you know, product is the defining word gets us to the next slide. The next slide is about uh, FinTech 2.0, which is a new movement. The defining word for that movement is audiences. We see companies that in the middle column that do it at scale. We see companies rolling out financial services to decrease friction, increase loyalty, give more value, capture more value. And so that's something that makes people think, oh, Uber and Shopify, it's not you know, singular examples. This is a trend. You also look to the left. Brex was a younger company back then. Companies that choose to marry financial services with software from day one and really go after one particular segment. And so some companies do it in landlords or schools or freelancers. But the idea was that established companies and young companies are going to marry financial services with software to become stronger and, and basically grow in their markets. And so that's something we chose to lead with. Um, and the next slide is really about- so One second on that last slide there. You made this deck in 2019. Does that still yes. hold true right now in 2022? Even stronger. Okay, great. We, we, you uh, have a... we... mm -hmm. Go ahead. So we, we now serve companies that, that come from dozens of segments, right? Uh, investment management, personal financial management tools, uh, construction, the freelance economy, the creator economy, universities, the elderly population, students. We learned over time how different companies think about patch, packaging financial services and really going after a specific audience. We think that the future of fintech is not defined by you know, 50 companies that everybody knows, but by 
5,000, 10,000 different software companies that deliver financial services in context, sometimes from day one, sometimes at scale. And so that was something that we preached back then that we think is even more true today, just based on the many anecdotes we've seen since. I've been involved in 300 plus sales processes in the company. And every time I meet a, a company that builds something really interesting for a specific segment, I, it kind of drives the point home and it clicks one more for me. Yeah, let, let's talk to Emlyn real quick about, about competitors too. Um, often when I talk to entrepreneurs, I like to hear their take on competitors. What, 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 is, what is your take on that? How often do you talk to people and that are unaware of things happening in their space? Well, every once in a while we do, and that that's a red flag. I mean, certainly Itai and Duran were intimately familiar with anyone who remotely would compete or planning to compete in their space. Mm -hmm. And they were very thoughtful about how they went to market and where the problems were. So yes, they are building the platform for which the next generation of financial services are coming on board. And it, you've seen that firsthand with the number of different verticals coming to play. But they also recognize that compliance, this idea of how do you onboard provide bank financial services, how difficult it is, because that's often the bottleneck. It's super complex and it's so ugly. And quite frankly, no one wants to own it, particularly as a non-fintech company. They don't want, they don't have the staffing, the knowledge base. And so for Ty, one of his first hires, as you mentioned, actually was a chief compliance officer, a woman, Amanda Sutherland from Sunrise Bank. And he knew that building into the products, building into the flow, because building into sales was going to be important because that's how critical compliance was in adoption. And I think to me, just, just from a pure competitive positioning and technology problems, we think about the stack that Duran has built, those two are unparalleled. And, and we knew that. That's, mm. That was the beauty of doing so much homework around the space. Yeah, great. Very good, let's continue here. So I think one more thing I would say is that the newer the newer a space is, the more nascent a space, the less competition matters. When you're trying to break into a market where they're buying decisions, you know, think about, if we sold to banks, we try to replace their core systems that they use. There are 9,000 financial institutions in the US, including credit unions. If you try to pitch to an investor, I'm going to be selling a new core system for these, even a modern core system, something that can get them deeper into the future. One of the key questions is going to be, of course, how are you going to drive decisions and who, are your, who is your competition? Is it FIS or FISER or you know, older companies that have established relationships? with these institutions and how are you going to fight them? But when you think about a, a nascent, a greenfield space, the question of competition is not that important because the market is being created as we speak and being very much in tune with um, customer demand and customer mentality is what matters. And M's comment about compliance was basically, we figured out that compliance was what is going to drive the decision of companies to work with us because we owned a very sensitive and frankly gray piece of this uh, stack. That's and so great, that, that, that's great what, insight. Yeah, so what we told until now was basically setting the stage and, and giving our investors an insight that something is happening in FinTech that they may have not thought about in a structured way. The transition from product focus to an audience focus. Um, and the next couple of slides are basically problem statements. We spoke to more than 60 companies in the process of starting the company. We basically heard the same things from all of them. Whether you're an old FinTech player or a new FinTech player, you're going to have to navigate bank relationships, compliance, and tech as the main sources of pain and, and brain damage. And we decided to take all these components and basically put them in one layer, which is unit. And we can go to the next slide and, and really um, deliver it behind an API, a dashboard, and a suite of end user banking apps. Right? So unit makes um, the process of offering bank accounts, cards, payments and lending a matter of five weeks as opposed to a year and a half and endless investment, typically in the uh, million or two plus. Cool. Um, I can go back just one slide to the solution again, to the, the boxes. Um, we, two, two choices we chose to, we, we, um, we made here are one that, you know, we, we led with Stripe as an approach. Uh, Stripe was not in the market back then. Stripe is trying to get involved in this market in some form. It's one of many things they do. So Unity is moving much faster here. But Stripe was an inspiring company for us when we thought about getting involved in banking because what they did in payments was not obvious when they got started. And over the years, they became what they are. So connecting in the investor's head, you know, someone who's looking at this deck, Stripe, massive success story to something we're trying to do is something that's going to um, excite them. And we will get back to them uh, later in the deck. Another choice we, uh, we made was take Etsy as, as an example um, client. Um, 
we, we did not have conversations with Etsy and obviously big companies are not going to take seed stage companies seriously in most cases. And so we just chose to, to use the name and, and go even deeper on the next slide. And what we try to do is basically deliver a, like take the imagination component that's missing for many investors and bring it to life. I think this is the slide that makes our deck exciting to me. This is the slide that shows you you know, if you think, if you look deeply enough, if you look closely enough into this uh, slide, you'll see that Etsy serves merchants. Etsy can now give those merchants a bank account that shows them their past balances, maybe their future projected balances based on the information they have, send payments, receive payments, get a faster um, cash advance on, on the yellow strip. You get a cash advance because you have payroll to make in a few days, and we know that you are eligible as a power seller. And so we try to take all the, the imagination we had for how vertical banking experiences are going to look and package them into something really lively. And I think this deck is probably 80% less effective without this slide to me. Like that was before we had this, I thought we had That's a weak deck. And right. after we had it, I was like, we nailed it. We, we, sh we showed what's possible. Yeah, see, see to me, right? And maybe to others, this, this slide particularly is not all that important. So how do you convey that? to an investor or, or to, to anybody that this, this right here is the key to our success because it's not calling out to me. It's, it's more of a um, attempt to describe how the future looks in our mind. Um, it's not so much a competitive advantage or an insight we have. It's something that lets you visualize how the end product is going to look. Unit had a thesis on the FinTech market. The FinTech market is going to get vertical. It's going to get absorbed in tech products, but mm -hmm. Without really seeing something like that, you can't visualize it. And today, you sure. think about Shopify Balance or other leading products, but back then, nobody had the imagination to say, yeah, an Etsy merchant can get a loyalty um, benefit from Etsy for being extra you know, successful, and they, they can get it in the form of financial service. And so I think also the fact that this slide is especially visual and especially um, like different looking, right? It's, it's odd. It's in the middle of the deck and it's just a screenshot. There's nothing else. Mm -hmm. That's something that ex I think gets people to pay attention. And when they see that they get, uh -huh, it can be like super cool if delivered in the right context. Yeah, so, so Emmeline, when did you know when you're clicking through this thing that this, this deal is gonna go through, you wanna write a check? So, I mean, I, I gotta be honest, we, we knew from the moment we met them back in the seat and we were really impressed by who they were. We were impressed by, I mean, just for context, I think, Duran, when we looked at the sector and met with a number of companies, probably one of the most technical minds, masterminds that we had met, building something built hard. I mean, he didn't just build part of you. He built the stack and he, you know, he, he created a ledger. I mean, he, he really went out and then, and then actually shared it. He was very open about here's where we are in our development process. Uh, and I think if you talk to folks in Israel, you'll find he's quite the rock star as well, quite the cult following. Um, and I think on Itai's side, really just wise beyond his years. I mean, I've, I've been doing venture for over 20 years and I have yet to meet somebody who is as passionate, humble, kind of really thoughtful, focused on both execution, which is core, but also culture, and and not just not just lip service. I mean, really dedicated to what that means. And I think that coupled with again already a thesis around the space, understanding what it is that we were looking for from a differentiation, from a go to market, from a tenacity. They hit, they checked all the boxes. So the question for us was, well, let's get, stay in touch. Let's figure out if they're going to continue to execute, which of course they did. And the question is whether or not we could, you know, we would fit their criteria for what they were looking for as well. You two are you two are heads over heels for each other. How do you <laughs> deal with disagreements? <laughs> Serious question though, because you both seem to like each other, but you mm -hmm. you have different goals. How do you handle disagreements? Well, look, so I, I can't I can't give a specific <laughs> example for something big, big we disagreed on, but I think you know one one theme in in investor and and company conversation is going to be how can we go faster? You know, especially when things are going well or okay, how can mm -hmm. we go faster? And so I think there's a, usually a tension between, and, and that's the right kind of tension because the board supervises the company, needs to push the company, challenge the company, it's encouraged. But when, you know, sometimes it's expressed as burn more, which never happened in our board. And, but I've heard about other boards in which it happened. Right. And sometimes it's expressed as, you know, what do you feel like are, are the bottlenecks in the company that we, need to free up, like how is money potentially going to help us solve bottlenecks that you see as fundamental in the company today? And, and how do we do it in a th thoughtful way? So I think 
there is always this tension. I see it with our investors and it's good because they're pushing us. Uh, but we also like to think from first principles and explain why we choose to hire someone or not hire someone or start a product or not start a product and, and use them as a sounding board. Um, your take on this. Uh, look, I mean, I, I think, and I think we, we're fortunate where there's a lot of respect. I mean, yes, uh, investors sometimes come at a slightly um, a, a different perspective at times, but I think there's always some respectful uh, disagreement in terms of where things go. And as it relates to the growth piece, that's absolutely a conversation that will that I've seen happen in prior board meetings. And, and in particular with UNIT, I would say they are already on a trajectory. They've been on such an incredible growth path. And the question is, you know, what's the right level of growth? And trusting the entrepreneur to figure out what they need to be successful. My only concern often is, can we scale Itai? Could we, you know, can we clone them or something? And the reality is you can't, or Duran for that matter. Um, but, but really understanding where, where those trade-offs are, because, you know, as we all know, growing too fast can also have its downside. Uh, so I, I think we have that respectful uh, push and discussion often. Sure. Uh, beyond that, I've been fortunate we haven't had too many disagreements thus far, but I yeah. believe we have enough respect for each other that we can have an open conversation about it. For the sake of this discussion, let, let's say you did have a disagreement and you have been in those boardrooms, right, <laughs> yes. where there has been. Give advice to entrepreneurs on, on how to handle that disagreement with a key investor. Yeah, I mean, look, I think it's important to understand that there's no, there's nothing there's no definitive answer. If there's a as a point of conflict, it's really trying to understand where's the investor coming from, what's driving their concerns, and really being open and sharing where your perspective is and trying to drive and try to really give context for maybe some decisions you've made or rationale around a particular set of convictions. And I think at the end of the day, if there is truly a point of respect and in mutual respect, I think you have to be able to have those find the common ground if there is common ground. And sometimes there isn't, honestly. And that's actually where I would uh, uh, really seek to think about across your board, where do you have the greatest relationships? Where do you feel that you've got greater support? How do you get others to weigh in and provide insight so that you have a better perspective in terms of what's happening at the board level and discussions more broadly? Yeah, that, that's great. Thank you. Well, I kind of derailed your pitch there. So let, let's continue <laughs> on the next, next slide. You have a few more to go. Yes. Um, something that doesn't fit into um, a typical deck arrangement, but we thought was important, was the, the, maybe busting the myth that what we're building is, is a thin layer or a middleware. That's, that's kind of the perception that there was around banking infrastructure. And you know, many companies look, or many funds look at companies like Galileo or I2C, which are the incumbents in the infrastructure space and said, you know, these incumbents are building a box. The box is a piece of middleware. The bank could, you know, build something like this themselves, or they could buy something for cheaper. Or like, wh how would you make money as a thin layer um, that that we consider middleware? And our, like, this is a bit of a, a mind game, right? You're trying to convince the investors that you're not building a piece of middleware. You're trying to shift the language to platform, which is something that the investors understand. Investors have seen companies like Stripe and Plaid growing to be very, very successful by their platform approach. And so, what I try to convey here is that. Don't think about this as a box that sits with a bank. Think about a, this market as being ripe for a platform shift and as unit, think about unit as the platform that enables that. And so again, replaying the Stripe story, think about what they did in 2009 when they got started. They basically built a, an access layer for money, you know, payment processing. And they over the years became the the operating system for money processing on the internet. And it happened because they started out as this small layer, but they took a platform path. They thought about themselves as a, as a company that faces the tech ecosystem and tries to serve the tech ecosystem confidently in a way that banks can't. And then they executed 10x better than the underlying banks consistently. And they added new value that the banks can't add by definition. So better fraud prevention, more tech, more financial products, more geographies, right? Even if Wells Fargo, as their US bank was able to go direct, um, Stripe is able to go to companies like um, Shopify and give them access to 50 markets and 50 banks. And so telling the story in a way that's much more ambitious than what has been told in the market teaches investors that you are in it for 10 plus years and that you have ideas for how to make it better. And so I think this, this is not the slide of invest in us. This is a slide of, we told you why you should, but here's why the company can be 50x larger than anyone thinks. Yeah, that's really and interesting. And that's another insight. 
Uh, we're running out of time, but I'm going to pause right here because I, th- I think it's an important fact. We see a lot of companies that are pitching what we consider features and not an mm-hmm. actual company. Mm-hmm. But sometimes the companies don't take that time to say, wait a second, hold on. Our feature is actually a, a company here. Mm-hmm. And it looks like we might have lost the slide deck for a second, but I'm, I'm sure it'll come back. There we are. All right, so finish this up. That's the FOMA slide. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's going to be one platform, just like Stripe in payment acceptance, that's going to be powering the future um, banking rails of the internet. And this is the platform we're building. So driving the point home, but um, doing it in a more concise and uh, authoritative way. Competitive landscape, because you have to, um, you know, we, there are incumbents, I mentioned some of them. Um, Unit was playing in a difficult uh, category in the space. And so we uh, basically positioned ourselves against a, an incumbent in the space, Synapse, which you see on the screen, but we basically tried to compare old approaches to new approaches. I think the story we had to tell in 2019 was this story. Today, if we had to redo the story, we wouldn't have to say why the right column wins. Back then, it was kind of, you know, who are you when Galileo is powering this bank or uh, I2C is powering this credit card? Today, we, it's much easier. We'll run out of time here because we, we talked a lot and this episode is going to go a little long, which is fine. But, but Em, I, want, I wanted to end this segment right here and we're going to switch to some startups and I'll give you both a chance to talk. But now that you've invested already in UNID, right? What do you tell your other investors as they're raising more money? Why do they need to come on? Well, gosh, I, <laughs> it has had quite the run. I don't, I don't know if he's ever actually had a fundraise since CA. <laughs> it's been quite opportunistic. Um, but I think one thing is for certain, they have their execution. They've been very committed for what they wanted to accomplish from the onset. And I saw that even in the seed leading up to the A. He, has, he, he and his team have been able to execute and grow the business at such astronomic rates relative to even how the growth of the overall sector. And I think that goes without saying. And that's really about against execution. It's against um, growing and scaling a business, not just growing and scaling monetization, and also doing it with culture in mind. And I think those are things that are just really hard to find, CEOs that can do that with that integrity, with that level of specificity and conviction. Um, and and I, obviously, the market has rewarded him for it. And he, again, as I said before, he, I haven't had to convince anyone. There have been many, many folks um, knocking on his door. Uh, well, I'm going to give you an extra two minutes here, Itai, but we, I teased this document at the beginning about this, this ethics document that you have. Can you mm-hmm. explain how this, this was involved in your pitch? Yeah. So um, when we raised our seed, we, um, we had some document in the company that was internal called Culture and Values. Actually, when we were just two people before we even knew what we were going to do as a team, we sat down and wrote a half, half a page on the type of, of environment we want to build. And that was a, the, the same Google Doc that we started back then is the doc today, it just has 11 pages. And it touches on many, many pieces of learning that we accumulated over the time. So when you raised our seed, we didn't need to speak to, um, to culture because it wasn't that um, established yet. But at Series A, it was into COVID. And we didn't have the ability to speak to investors face-to-face. And also like the market was insanely hot and everybody was super busy, which is now the new normal. But back then it was important for us to give people a window into how we execute as a team, give them a chance to almost spend an hour in the office with us without being in the office with us. And the best way to do it was to share what was then a seven or eight page culture and values doc. And that got us a lot of excitement between investors. So I think We do it because it's important for the business. We do it as a matter of expectation setting with candidates, with employees. And there's something constitutional in the company that drives how we execute. But I also found that one of the really cool byproducts was to take this asset that we've built and just share it. Like, who who cares? Like, I, you know, people, some people keep it confidential. I was like, investors should get a window into the company, should know how we think. And that's so that was really important. When I do the recap post for this episode and I embed mm-hmm. your slide deck, can I embed this mm-hmm. document as well? Uh, yes, I think Google Docs is ready for this kind of traffic. All right, great. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. It can handle it. Hey, Matt, I will <laughs> say I will say that I, in my whatever, 20 plus years, have never seen a document like it. I've seen obviously, you know, high level values, culture documents, bullets and whatnot, but the level of specificity 
the commitment, it really gave a sense as to how they were going to operate. And it really has been the Bible. And it, and it certainly has expanded over time to Itai's point. But it, you just got a real sense of how he's planning on leading, particularly across you know, two different headquarters uh, and, yeah. and, and how, how one scales. And I think it's really impressive. It was important for us. Yeah, a lot, a lot of startups and companies have uh, editorial documents, right, on how to spell, spell different things, but they don't have value. So that's really neat. Well, thank you both for joining us, and and I really do appreciate it. Uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit and go into a pitch feedback session. And just to give everybody the, the ground rules, these entrepreneurs uh, submitted their names to our staff about 20 minutes ago, and they're going to have two minutes to pitch without a slide deck. And we're just going to give them feedback on their pitch. And it's important that they're not using a slide deck because not every company needs one, but every company needs a pitch. So as we're loading those up, um, I'm going to give you a little tease on tomorrow. Tomorrow is another episode of Found Live where Daryl and, and Jordan are going to have an entrepreneur and talk about the founding of their company. And then TC uh, Early Stage is our first live and in-person event since COVID started. And we're very excited about this. It's in April in San Francisco. Early bird tickets are still available for $250. And all this information and more is available in the reception area of Hopin. So uh, with that, folks, are you ready for the, the pitch off? So it's good. All right, great. So first, we're going to have Ohm from Save Away. Ohm, are, are, are you online here? It's always a, a challenge. I'm getting a note from our producer, Julio. Uh, are you able to hear me okay? Yep, we got it. Okay, very, very uh, good. Uh, All right, Ohm. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. You got so it. I'm going to give you yeah. two minutes. Um, we're going to start the clock. If there is a clock, I don't even know if there is, but we're going to start it right now. Welcome to Save Away. I'm founder and CEO, Om Kundu. Saving now uh, to pay later, smartly and socially to fulfill purchases without credit or debt. Uh, there's a gaping hole today when people are looking to make bigger purchases while there's an infinite number of ways in which to buy with credit that often becomes a slippery slope to debt. There hasn't been a way to financially plan and save to make big purchases. Saveaway provides that to dual strength Tylenol, not only alleviating the pain of buyers to save up to make that purchase, but also equally allowing sellers access to un, under and ill-served customers. What's furthermore is friends and family can gift along with the best offers so that the purchasing power of the saver is greatly increased as is their ability to fulfill the purchase. It can be accessed directly through our site as well as through a checkout button with uh, partnering e-commerce and online banking sites. The people that have tried, out, tried it out have been very passionate, on average have invited four others, which is why without marketing, we've grown to a waiting list of over 17,000. Our tech stack can be harnessed for a number of life events. We've talked about e-commerce here, where we've integrated eBay and Etsy, but you can equally use this for the down payment for your home, which is one of the use cases where we're talking to one of the largest mortgage lenders in the country. So the product is ready, the IP is de-risked, there is demonstrated demand, and every ounce of support at this stage is primed to deliver a force multiplying uh, outcome, a true fintech icon, some of you may know, just invented in the current round. So join the movement to save now, pay later, and save for what matters. Thank you. Very nice, I like your passion, Thanks, that was great. Um, let's let's have you start out. Do you have any feedback? Absolutely. Hey, um, thank you so much for um, presenting. Really appreciate it. Uh, you know, I think I appreciate how you uh, structured the problem and then kind of went into some of the solutions. One thing that goes without saying, given how um, you know pervasive buy now pay later is, is, is why 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 is save now the, the right method? You know, why not? There's so many folks who for whom they're eligible to do buy now pay later, um, and and that's actually what it's opened up. And I, I understand at the highest level why, but I think really at least articulating that and why you would win relative to how much um, a support buy now pay later has had, uh, particularly at the checkout and other relevant um, 
exit points. And so just, I think that would be, would be an area that I would be important to understand. You do uh, sure, happy to respond to it if, 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 if you like. Yeah, so I think, you know, at, at, at our current stage, we are complementary. When someone, for any number of reasons, fails to pay an installment in their buy now, pay later, or is delinquent on their credit, gets turned down, those folks don't have any options. And we can serve that on under an ill-served customer base. Again, I think the number is around between a fourth and a third of the customers that are buying now, paying later, are failing to pay one of their installments and therefore may have problems getting a second opportunity at that. So the journey of a million miles begins with the simple step of serving, as Claiborne Christensen would uh, like to see us do, serving the customer base that no one is serving based on the market opportunity that we see. That itself is a 500 plus million dollar market. And then of course, beyond that, you know, the, the power that we're providing to save in multiple ways results in anti-fragility of users. The reason why, the biggest reason why people fail to save is let's say they save using their paycheck and their paycheck stops because they get laid off and then they're not able to fulfill that saving goal. Because they're saving in multiple ways through our platform, through direct deposit auto pay, but also through gifting from best friends and family, uh, it allows them to reach the goal in a much more anti-fragile manner. Oh, thank you for that. Itai, do you have any questions, feedback? Um, yeah, I, I love the the mission. Obviously, it's uh, it's it's a rising category, um, and I like the mission. I think there are some really difficult business questions to ask that M already touched on. With like, how do you bite into this category, which is full of incentives that are not always in the favor of the end customers, but do it in an effective way? So I think it's there's definitely a, a tough nut to crack here, but. That's one thing that comes to mind. I think I would like to maybe comment on the how of the pitch. Um, I'm a big fan yeah. of visuals. We're all visual processors. We, you know, 40% of our brain is dedicated to visual processing. And sometimes we can describe an idea in two minutes, but one screenshot like the one I showed was, is going to help you drive the point home. I think all of us can visualize, but maybe three slides that are almost like a pitch MVP can help people, you know, mm -hmm. think about brands. That, you know, when, when I've heard the story of save now, buy later, I think the brands that are mostly associated with it are expensive brands. And so if you take an expensive brand, you put it on the screen, like we did with Etsy, just, you know, or your own scrappy version of that and, and have a, you know, specific item like a jacket and a specific price mm. and something that really ties the story and make it, makes it visual. Sometimes that's better than talking for two minutes. Sometimes you need to talk for 45 seconds when you have something like that. Yeah, that, that's very um, good. Great. Yeah, I think the rules of engagement here didn't allow for any visual mm -hmm. aid. Your background. Correct. Your background. <laughs> okay. Very, very you have good. Control Thank, you. That. Thank yes. you. Well, that's quite the hack. So um, I don't know if we're, we're going to allow backgrounds anymore. But that, that was very good. I, one question, though, Om. What what do you find that your what do you find in your pitch that you have to explain over and over again in questions? Uh, well, I think, you know, uh, people seem to think that instant gratification is uh, second nature to us. And I think as we think in uh, big tech, big finance about the blind spots, I think there is a flip side to instant gratification in ways that delayed gratification and financial wellness can provide, and I think unbeknownst to some, I think there is a rising you know, tide of people you know, younger that are cutting up their credit cards, that are seeing those vehicles for what they are, and I think they need to get a voice, and I hope we can do justice in giving them a voice on why we're not just an app, but a movement um, you know, you for um, showing the world that no goal is out of reach if you save for what matters. Well, thank you for that. We're out of time, but for the people not listening on Hopin, where your link is, can you give you your URL on the stream here? Absolutely, will uh, will do. Uh, uh, happy to do so, and every anyone uh, on the site, we're happy to give them uh, okay. your uh, complimentary access to the platform.
Thank you. All right. All right, Owen from Save Away. Thank you so much. Thank you. FinTech is like we, we planned that. So uh, next we have Duff. We have two more companies. We have Duff from Off We Go. I hope that's a travel site because I, I need travel so bad. <laughs> Duff, are you around? Looks like you're there. Hey, folks. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Awesome. Um, All right. Well, just... you have two minutes. To kick it off. <laughs> Awesome. Well, you know, my name is Doc. I'm the co-founder and the CEO of Off We Go. It is travel related. We're a traveler centric risk management solution for international education, digital nomads and remote first employers. Now, while my co-founder was studying abroad in Australia, he spent three weeks traveling around Thailand, rented a moped and rounded a sharp turn with faulty brakes and ended up winding up getting stitched up by a 12 year old in exchange for English lessons. <laughs> Now, the problem at the heart of this is that risky behavior and outdated safety systems drive higher costs. Nearly 70% of students don't report their independent off-campus travel while in school-sponsored programs, meaning the schools own the risk but are flying blind. In the corporate world, it's the same. Where does business travel and personal travel begin, especially with over 85% of Gen Z wanting to work remote in some fashion, this ever-present gray area is growing. Thus, there's Off We Go, a mobile-first solution developed to accommodate travel managers' need for gathering and reporting required travel data and the desire for travelers to have fun in the places that they travel. We match travelers together, going to similar places at similar times, while partnering with travel insurers and the assistance companies to provide the necessary uh, travel risk management data, on-call services, etc. We gather this information, provide it to their above stakeholders, and partner with the travel insurers for underwriting capabilities. And despite COVID complications, we've seen over 50% month over month web traffic growth on social and website channels, uh, got three new paid pilots with three more hot leads in the pipeline and have over 95% satisfaction rate with our MVP users. We're currently searching for strategic investors and insurance partnerships with our raise of 750K to a million for our pre-seed and seed raise. So thank you and off we go. <laughs> I love the kicker, that's great. <laughs> Emily, you were writing a lot of notes there. Let's start with you. Yeah, I like taking notes. Sometimes it just helps me think about um, what feedback to really give, wanting to make it impactful. So I think for you, first of all, just at a high level, no reading. You know, you're you obviously are very engaging. You probably are very passionate about your business. We we love feeling that passion and excitement from an entrepreneurs. So don't need to read. It, it takes it away. And then I start to think about well, why is he reading? Is he engaged with me? And things that you don't want investors to think about. The second is really around. It, Walking through the, the acquisition strategy, right? Because it's, you know, look, I get you can partner with folks, you can find the right times to engage, potentially provide new insurance products that make sense. But how? I mean, that's a long tail. We're talking about a lot of different avenues. What is your secret sauce there? Um, if you're just buying ads, honestly, you know that that's a game that a lot of people can play. So I just really dub double clicking on the how, and particularly on the reach side of the, the equation, would have been helpful for me. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not sure who is uh, who is paying you. How do you make money? Yep. Um, so we are uh, we have a few different revenue channels. We are B two B two C directly selling to the institutional organization. Uh, we are direct to consumer. We, uh, you can purchase you know on a freemium model, um, and then on the partnership distribution side with the insurance companies. Um, so we get a commission from you know the folks that uh, purchase mm -hmm. a policy that includes off we go. So you're both B two C and B two B two C. Correct. Why B2C? Why not just B2B2C? We uh, found traction there. And so, you know, why close down a revenue channel when we're, we're finding success? It's, it's expensive to maintain two channels that require such different skill sets to grow. Um, it's true that both could work, but if you have limited resources as a CEO, I think what one thing you want to do is to ask yourself, how can you deal the business effectively with just one of them initially? Um, yep. And it could be any any of them. I think you know going direct to consumer is going to be very difficult in this kind of business because the incentives are not necessarily with the consumer. Um, and I, I see one of your uh, messaging on the website is uh, find travel companions. I don't know if it's a problem that people actually suffer from, but I think if they're encouraged to gather in groups by an agent that sends them somewhere or supervises their travel, maybe that's going to work better. I just, I don't see a strong B2C angle. I just don't see enough incentives. As someone that likes to travel, I just, I wouldn't find something like this or, or have interest in it. Um, and so I think business customers are going to potentially be slower to adopt this. 
But if you can identify strong incentives, you can use them as a distribution channel. And, and it could be that you don't really want to sign up individual travelers. Like you don't care if 500 people or 1,000 people are, using, are getting referred by an agency. You care about the agency paying you, right? So adoption is going to be done through the agencies. And that's, that's kind of one thing that comes to mind. I've seen many companies. I've helped many companies in, in 2017 as EIR in, in a fintech accelerator. And I, I think the split brain of working with two audiences and not defining clearly which audience you serve is, is going to potentially hurt you. Yeah, we found actually really good traction with the, the finding. Um, so, you know, that, that social element, that's probably one of the key drivers mm -hmm. of adoption. Um, it just depends on the traveler. So I totally agree. I don't I'm a risk taker. I like to travel by myself. Um, there's, there, there's a minute left. Anything else? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely echo Itai, as I said earlier, I think, you know, again, as, as you crystallize what your go to market is, what your which which target you have, I thought it was I was hoping it was B2B to C because I think there's a lot more legs there in terms of your ability to reach more. And ultimately, it, it's, again, incentives are aligned. So which is confused me when you're using, you know, um, Google and whatnot as your mode of acquisition. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would just say that those are to me being very crystal clear on that. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think we're using Google as acquisition, but yeah. Okay, well, that's good. Uh, you'd mentioned uh, you'd mentioned uh, Google Ads and some others. I maybe I missed. Oh no, um, I never mentioned Google. But okay, yeah. Okay, uh, the and uh, and I think on the traction side, you'd mentioned a little bit of how you've gotten traction, which is very exciting. The more you can kind of paint the momentum picture, I think is also would be very helpful. And even some specific case studies would actually maybe even help crystallize it further. Cool. Perfect. Thank you. That's yeah. great feedback. Duff, thanks so much for coming on. I, I appreciate it. Hope to see you next week too. I appreciate the feedback. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, we have time for one more company. We have Angela coming on from, I'm going to guess, Praxi. I, I don't know, though. Angela, do you want, do you want to clarify that for me? Looks like you're muted. Yes, here I am. <laughs> Can you guys see me okay? Oh, my little sticky. I have there you a are. Me on it. Hey there, gentlemen or oh, and ladies. Hi. <laughs> so, uh, Pixi, I believe that's what you were asking. Oh yes, say it one more time. Pixi. Pixi, it's I love it. Amalgamation of AI and a constellation Pixis. So, Pixi. Beautiful. Well, you have two minutes to pitch us. Go ahead. Excellent. So um, I am co-founder of Pixi, and we're highlighting the power of soft skills in talent acquisition through our video assessment platform. So have you ever worked in a team where people look frustrated, confused, sad, or even upset? Eventually, you begin to feel defeated. Poor teams and poor managers create very toxic work cultures, and this is why 55% of American workers plan to leave their current jobs right now. People want to work for companies they believe in and with coworkers that value them. So um, companies are also realizing on the other end that hiring for hard skills and firing for lack of soft skills is fueling the huge $223 billion toxic workplace problem. So, which is exactly what I observed working for a big multinational as a data analyst. And my co-founder, a humongous uh, genius that he is, he also noted the same. Um, he worked with the World Bank, Harvard, MIT, and he also built software used by Google, Facebook, and many um, universities and the federal government. He has founded also two venture startups and um, we're backed by Y Combinator. So we put our insights and our technical expertise together and we decided to form a solution for hiring for soft skills, which really are the building blocks of great work cultures and are vital to long lasting job success. Our video interviewing platform allows for skills like communication, adaptability, creativity to be identified earlier in the hiring process. We help organizations uh, source first for soft skills through our asynchronous video interview, our proprietary soft skills assessment powered through our AI models and powerful data that we turn into reporting and analytics. We generate revenue three ways. Um, first, our automated sourcing um, that clients can seamlessly source on our platform for a fee ranging $200 to $800 per candidate. And additionally, um, our recruiters can help um, with uh, sourcing directly and also uh, recruiting at a 15% of the higher annual salary and I ran out of time. Thank you, Angela. Thanks, thanks for that. 
Uh, that was very polished. You've done that before. I have, and I just needed like 20 more seconds to finish. <laughs> I'll give you 20 seconds. Go on. Okay, great. So I'll talk about my traction this time around. Um, so our traction, we have 33 paying customers, um, which we have from used from pool of, of 11,000 job seekers. Um, the mo global market is at $29 billion, of which um, 13 is in the U.S. alone. And right now we're raising a $3 million seed. Great. Perfect. All right. Itai, do you want to go first in this one? Yeah. Um, I think it's a problem that you are solving. It's a big problem that you're solving. So that's, that's good. Um, I wonder how do you pitch to someone that uses, you know, recruiters and HR people to screen mm -hmm. for soft skills because that's the, that's the current mode of operation. Okay. Um, I think it took you, it took you very long to get to the solution. I think you talked about the problem for more than a minute and 20 seconds. Getting to the solution is like, the problem is clear. You could have like, everybody suffers from, you know, employees with uh, poor interpersonal skills and soft skills. You could have just stated it in 15 seconds and moved to the solution because that's the, the gist. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so like, I, I think one of the questions is, is how do you insert yourself in the, in the hiring process? Is it a, an extension, like a, almost like a Zoom uh, presence of sorts that you know, give, gives me a feedback on someone based on their Zoom meeting? Or like, you know, are you replacing the interviews? If you're you know, sort of coming before my interviews or after, how would that work? I just think it's really important to sort of connect the dots and help me understand how it speaks to my current hiring process. Got it. So our storytelling needs to be polished off for sure because mm -hmm. there is a story here. So we've been at this for three years. Effectively, mm -hmm. what happened was uh, the first two years, we focused on really trying to um, screen at the top of the hiring funnel. So effectively, mm -hmm. if you have a current um, talent acquisition process, we would come in and say, hey, before you even touch any of the can job candidates, um, hire us will help you do the automated screening via our asynchronous mm -hmm. video interviews. And mm -hmm. then you get a list of candidates. And then from there, you then start doing your phone calls or whatever other types of, of screening you want. We identified that that was a vitamin and not a, a painkiller for 90% mm -hmm. of, the, of the companies that we spoke to. Mm -hmm. Hey, Angela, this is amazing. I, soft skills is huge. Like we don't get to it until at the end when the interview, when it's too late to go back. Right. Mm -hmm. So everyone was telling me this is great, but our traction wasn't there. Right. Mm -hmm. So what we mm -hmm. did um, starting this year, actually, um, Kurt developed um, our new, basically it's a marketplace. So effectively what we're using, using right now is using our um, core product to source for job candidates. So we're doing two things, source for job candidates. And then we, we tell the companies, Hey, you want people that are really good, that have really strong soft skills here they are. And so they go in and they, and they purchase either one or two, um, uh, profiles, um, mm -hmm. that we have video resumes and data analytics. Mm -hmm. so I think that doing two things at a startup is a very dangerous concept. Marketplace? I, I don't know the right name, but I know that if you are, like, I would listen if you told me that you have a Zoom plugin that gives me a one to 10 score for each candidate I'm interviewing over Zoom for their soft skills. I would buy that. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe pay you per interview, $2 per interview, $5 per interview. You can convince me to do it, but you can't convince me to, do, to outsource my uh, sourcing function to you and have soft skill screening built into that. And so I think you need to design your product in a low friction way that would weave itself more nicely into how companies operate. And, and you really need to be seeking the resistance. And I think my resistance is nobody's going to sit on the sourcing channels and nobody, no machine is going to meet people, great people, before I meet them because I want to be there and sell to them. If it takes me you know, five hours more to meet them, other companies could, could be speaking to them. And so avoid becoming a blocker in the process avoid taking over activities that are coming before my activities maybe find a way to plug yourself into how i do interviews you know there are platforms like gong for salespeople, and i'm using i'm using gong as an example because i think it can help you convince investors to invest gong revolutionized like they're one of several companies that revolutionized the science of sales 
by creating a Zoom participant in sales meetings. And they transcribe all the information. They tell you about the you know, words that are being used or you know, not being used or keywords, and they give you sales intelligence. And so I think you could, you could tell investors, I'm building Gong for recruiting. And then they're gonna be, oh, it's a $6 billion company. It's a huge space. Nobody saw it coming. Somebody's doing it for this space. And so I think speaking in sort of familiar terms and company names can sometimes get you much more attention. But that's, that's a product feedback more than anything. Got it. I appreciate it. I will definitely look into it. Matt, I, really, I can't hear you, Matt. Well, there we go. It was, it was a wonderful product feedback. And Angela, I'm going to give you one more on, on our way out the door. We saw two different versions of you. The first one, you were reading the pitch, and it was good. And then you came alive in the answers, and you're so knowledgeable. And I, I want to hear from that one. Got it. I yeah. want to hear from I want to hear from the heart and and not when you're reading and I I know the pain for that because I have to read scripts and it's hard right you got to inject your personality into it, but you have to say certain things. Yes, and in under two minutes. <laughs> yes, I know, I know, I feel for you. Yeah, yeah, great. But, but yeah, there is definitely something there for you. Excellent, I know there is. Yes, so, thank you so much for your time, Angela, and I hope to see you around next time yeah. too. Thank you. Yeah, and <laughs> thanks, thanks Ita. Thank you. Itai and, and, and um, thank you so much for joining us. This, this has been a blast. This is my first one of the year, so it was a good way to start out the year. Next week, we have a special edition with, with a SaaS company. And then uh, tomorrow, Jordan and Daryl are interviewing people on Found. And please join on Hopin so you can participate in the conversation. You can ask questions and, and join the, the pitch off too. So until next week, thank you very much. Thanks.